This box includes an AMD Ryzen processor and a high performance AMD Wraith thermal solution. This is that high performance thermal solution that AMD is talking about. And today let's talk about why you might or might not want to upgrade from the stock cooler. And also if you do choose to stick with it, how you might be able to get it to work a little bit better. Welcome to Machines and More. Off the heels of the roundup of mid-range CPUs featuring the excellent 5600X, I wanted to take a look at the chip a little more and specifically with regards to the stock cooler and also the curve optimizer that is the unique functionality of Ryzen 5000. Now I'll admit I've never been a big fan of the stock cooler and it's nice that AMD includes it, but I think many of us would rather have the CPU be cheaper while having the option to just get whatever cooler is best for our particular builds. Now, for this generation, that is the case with the 5800X and the 5900X, and they no longer come with a cooler, but I'm not exactly sure they're cheaper than they would have been either. Nonetheless, I'm specifically looking today at the 5600X since it still comes with that cooler. And let's just jump into the performance you can expect with that stock Wraith cooler. Now, first off, in a bare bones PBO auto scenario with the stock cooler set to 80% fans, multi-core frequencies will tend to hover around 4,200 megahertz. Now, I chose 80% because it's just below that point where this thing goes haywire in terms of sound and it still works acceptably well. Now with PBO on auto, most motherboards will push to as much voltage and boost frequencies to where the chip hits 75 degrees. And at least for this test scenario in Cinebench R23, 4200 megahertz is as high as it goes on as little as about 1.1 volts. So it is topping out pretty early. Performance isn't as good. The stock boost for the 5600X should hit between 4.3 gigahertz to 4.5 gigahertz. So on bone stock with the stock cooler, the R23 score is only at about 9600. And for something like 3D Mark's Time Spy CPU test, we're hitting 7,665. One thing to note is that your CPU has a predefined curve for voltage and its clock frequency. So for example, it might be at 1.1 volts at 4.2 gigahertz, 1.18 volts for 4.3 gigahertz, 1.28 volts at 4.4, 1.35 for 4.5, etc. The stock curve is going to be on the conservative side because AMD has to assign something that is guaranteed to work. In other words, clock lower for the same voltage. Otherwise, your system is gonna crash all the time. At least a lot of CPUs will do that. You can dial in a voltage offset in your system's bias, but all that's going to do typically just tell the system to give less voltage overall but it's still going to want to follow that curve. So all you are doing is just getting lower clock boosts and lower performance as a result. You might've heard of something called the silicon lottery. And that is just one way of saying that not all silicon is born equal. Within a certain bin of chips or grouping of chips, there is still difference between the best ones and the worst ones. And that's why some chips, even though they're the same skew, can overclock better than others. Now, because they all passed validation for the minimum level of performance, they all will work at the predefined stock voltage and frequency curve. But if you happen to have a good chip or at least a halfway decent one, you might be able to run on a little bit less or a lot less voltage and still hit those same clock speeds and your thermals will be better, which is why the curve optimizer is such a special tool in Ryzen 5000. And what it allows the user to do is set up negative offsets to that voltage and frequency curve and that will allow higher clocks to be achieved with that same voltage. What you will want to do is go into BIOS, and I'm using Gigabyte's board here, but most Ryzen 5000 boards will have a similar interface, and you will want to incrementally set up a curve optimizer profile. And at a high level, it's fine to just go all core to start. You could go more granular and set up a per core offset if you have time, since some cores are actually better than others. In fact, Ryzen Master will automatically tell you which one is the best core and the second best core, but at least this gives you a high level idea of the process. From my experimentation, I'm seeing each increment of 10 offset equates to about 50 to 70 millivolts less voltage for the equivalent clock frequency. Now, I would use a utility like Cinebench and just run it after each setting change. Provided your system doesn't crash, you can then experiment further. For this particular chip, I was able to go to as much as a negative 25 offset, but there is a point where it appears performance does actually get worse. So find where that apex of performance is with your chip. 
and for this one it was a negative 20 all core offset now your mileage may vary another setting you might want to change here is just to lift that max boost to 200 megahertz i haven't seen too much of a difference with that and the stock cooler since you're not able to go that high necessarily but if you do upgrade your cooling you definitely want to just let it uh, not be limited so back to that stock cooler for just 15 minutes or so of experimentation, you are actually able to increase your performance significantly. You'll also notice that the thermal window is opened up more and the CPU is now aggressively asking for voltage because here the chip is actually hitting well into the 80s and it is drawing above 1.2 volts or so. But for the extra 100 millivolts of extra voltage, you're getting about 250 megahertz more, which is quite a good trade-off. And as expected, because of the higher clocks, both the score in Cinebench and 3D Mark go up to about 10,500 and 8060 respectively. So it is a good boost of performance that you didn't have before, and it's really not too bad for the stock cooler. If you found a good offset, then I'd test a bit more. I'd say play some games if that's what you usually do with the chip or run some CPU based renders. Just do what you usually do. Some folks will recommend doing Prime 95 for 24 hours and, and that's totally fine too. I just think that if you find it stable enough for gaming or your daily tasks, then it might be good enough to proceed. There are still high temps involved here, so stability may be a concern and that alone is good enough reason to step up to something a little bit more robust. And with a stock cooler, you're pretty much limited to less than 4.5 gigahertz anyway. So if you wanna go higher than that on all cores, then you definitely wanna upgrade. I am running this uh, part of the test with a U12A equipped with just one single fan locked to a low, low 1100 RPM. Certainly I think even this that is an overkill situation for the chip, but just to give you an idea of the acoustic difference, take a listen here because it's basically silent. Thermals wise, for Cinebench, you are seeing thermals peak at around 75 versus this 86 or so from the stock cooler. And those are much safer temps to be at. Scores with this halfway U12A are a significant jump up. You'll see clocks go anywhere from about 4650 to maybe 4700 megahertz. And for multi-core workloads, that is a huge difference because we're hitting close to stock 10700K levels here. But does it matter for gaming usage though? So I tested a more CPU bound title in 1080p in Far Cry 5 and running that benchmark after gaming a bit to warm things up, the better cooler gave about four additional FPS, which honestly is really insignificant at these frame rates. I mean, thermals are better even when set up purposely in an unoptimized airflow layout because I just took off the rear case fan here check out the top case and just to give it kind of a more difficult operating environment for everything involved. So the gaming thermals are about seven degrees or so better with that tower cooler. In addition to those obvious noise benefits, because if you tried to noise normalize it, <laughs> it would completely blow the stock cooler out of the water. Now, even with higher temps, the CPU is able to give the fewer cores used enough juice to get good performance. For a typically GPU bound title like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, there is basically no difference. The stock cooler actually yielded a bit better result that is just really run to run variants, but is entertaining nonetheless. There's a huge difference in thermals though, but the utilization of the CPU is low enough that it CPU is not really inhibited by it. So to sum it all up, the stock cooler is actually surprisingly capable for gaming. If you're just starting out, maybe stick with it and see how good you can get it. Thermals and noise are not great though. And performance wise, it is okay, depending on the title and the resolution. So it might be good enough for you and trying out that curve optimizer will definitely help you bring out the most in your chip. Personally, I'd spend a little more and if you have the space, get something that will be better optimized for your particular case, be it a tower cooler or a bigger top down low profile cooler. And those five towers that were reviewed previously here on the channel are all good candidates here. And when coupled with Curve Optimizer, you are really getting almost out of the performance that you can out of these chips. Hope that was helpful and that you're enjoying your 5600X or thinking of getting one. I love it and it's a fantastic CPU. And please consider subscribing to the channel and check out some of the products linked down below for the CPU and some great coolers as well. So thanks for watching today.